talking to you all. Um, I thought I'd talk to you about some work that I've um, recently been doing in Patagonia, uh, looking at how the Patagonian ice sheet has evolved through the last glacial maximum and all the way to the present day. And this was a big project and I was fortunate to have a large number of fantastic collaborators. Mike Kaplan is, is one of them and he was instrumental in this project. Um, and we have a, a number of people from the US, from Chile and from Britain working on this project. So it was great fun to work with all these different people. Um, it's recently come to fruition and it was published uh, last year. So it's really exciting to be here to, to tell you all about it. We know globally that glaciers are uh, driving a lot of mass change in the oceans. So although glaciers have a much smaller total mass than the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, over the last few decades and projected for the next few decades, they have lost substantial amounts of ice. And the biggest contributions have been from places like the Alaskan ice fields and the Patagonian ice fields. And in fact, the Patagonian ice fields, which are the SAN large red bubble here down in southern South America, have uh, delivered 1,208 billion tonnes of ice to the ocean uh, since the 1960s. So if we are to understand how this might change in the future and how this might affect water resources in Patagonia or how it might affect sea level change, what we really need is a detailed empirical record of past change that we can use in order to evaluate numerical simulations and to improve forward modelling. There's been a number of studies evaluating contemporary mass change in Patagonia, um, which means that we know that across southern South America, they're losing 19 billion tonnes each year, and most of that is from Patagonian ice fields. You can see here in this in this figure from Brown et al. 2019, the big red circles, and these red circles are the uh, the elevation change rate (DHDT). And you can see that um, although we have uh, elevation change right the way through from northern South America, it's really from southern South America that we see the most volume change. This has implications for a variety of things, including water resource management uh, and irrigation, uh, hazards from glacial lake outburst floods. In fact, there was a glacial lake outburst flood in Patagonia just last week, uh, as well as a more global impacts such as sea level rise. And in fact, the large contribution of fresh water from these ice fields can also affect uh, global circulation patterns. And we've seen uh, that happen in the, in the past. An analysis of the water tower index of southern south of South Chile showed that there are these are important water towers where there's a large supply of water coming from the southern Andes and that large supply of water is important for hydropower and irrigation in um, the land, the drier land uh, east of the ice fields and it's vulnerable to changes in mean annual precipitation as well as increasing demands on that water as both population rises and GDP rises. So we know that the Patagonian ice fields are important, but there are still big uncertainties in how they relate to climate. So that a different cha it's challenging to understand what the mass balance sensitivities of these glaciers are and what kind of climate signals they behave with. If we want to understand how they're going to behave in the future, we need to know how they interact with different atmospheric circulation patterns and different uh, decadal oscillations or centennial oscillations of climate. And it's previously been proposed in the literature that we had re-advances or stabilizations of these glaciers during things such as the Younger Dryas and the Little Ice Age, which we typically think of as more northern hemisphere climatic patterns as well as during events such as the Antarctic cold reversal, which we typically associate with uh, areas south of the, um, uh, areas in the Southern hemisphere, south of the subtropical front. One of the challenges in Patagonia, however, is that a large number of these uh, glaciers terminate in lakes and those lakes changed in elevation and size throughout the last glacial cycle. And that means that untangling Glacier mass balance changes as a result of climate fluctuations is difficult to untangle from more dynamical behavior of the glaciers due to changes in carving dynamics. 
And over the last 10 years, perhaps, it's been keen, become increasingly obvious that it's the southern westerly winds that are a really strong control on these ice dynamics. Because these southern westerly winds bring, uh, as they flow over the moist, uh, the ocean, they become very moist and they bring the abundant precipitation that, Antarct that the Patagonian ice fields rely on. So if these southern westerly winds change in their intensity or the core belt of these westerly winds moves further north or further south, we may see a change in the glaciers as a result of that. So it's important that we try and understand and untangle these different climatic versus dynamical effects on the ice and how they might influence downstream hydrology. So what we really need is empirical ice sheet reconstructions. If we want to produce numerical simulations of these glaciers to project uh, forwards change, we need to test uh, ensembles of simulations or test uh, calibrate simulations against a variety of different climate states and different magnitudes of climate forcings. So I was keen to produce a robust data set that could be used for calibrating models and to shed insights into the paleoclimatic and internal controls on these past ice dynamics. One of the really special features about the Patagonian ice fields is that they have an extremely large latitudinal range uh, going up the southern Andes in a very long, thin ice, uh, ice sheet at the last glacial maximum. And that provides a useful test case to look at how the southern westerly winds have behaved and we might expect to see latitudinal gradients in these ice fields. And that might give us an improved understanding of these southern westerly winds. This is Patagonia today and there are two most significant ice fields. There's the North Patagonian ice field and the South Patagonian ice field. And then smaller ice masses in Cordillera Darwin and Gran Campo Nevado. And around that, there are uh, thousands of tiny glaciers and smaller ice fields as well, such as Monte San Lorenzo. Uh, they have a total glacier volume of 5,900 gigatons, uh, kilometers cubed, which is 5,458 gigatons of ice, which is a sea level equivalent of 15 millimeters. So they are a substantial reservoir of, of water that could, be, that could produce sea level rise in the future. Uh, it's uh, just a reminder about the southern westerly winds. Uh, today, the subtropical front is contracted around Antarctica and the core strong belt of the southern westerly winds is, is contracted po polewards. Uh, so we get an intensification at a, a higher latitude. At the last glacier maximum, the subtropical front expanded northwards and that core of the southern westerly winds interacted with a larger part of uh, uh, the southern Andes, bringing um, large amounts of precipitation to the Andes and driving uh, large glacier growth. Whether or not well, the, the latitudinal position of, these, of this core of the southern westerly winds is controlled by the southern annular mode. Um, if the southern annular mode is positive, those westerlies contract towards Antarctica with weaker westerlies over Patagonia, and in a negative southern annular mode phase, those westerlies expand northwards, bringing stronger winds and more storms over Patagonia. So in a positive phase, which is where we are today and have been for the last couple of decades, it's warm and dry and Patagonian glaciers are receding. In negative phases, it's cold and wet and the Patagonian glaciers are advancing. And we can reconstruct this sand behavior independently from things like paleo lake records and then relate changes in the glaciers to changes in these in these winds and try and untangle dynamical changes from climatic changes from temperature changes using that independent record. One of the reasons why we are particularly interested in the southern westerly winds is not is because they're not just important in Patagonia, but they're also important in Antarctica. They're a key control on Antarctic circumpolar currents, uh, most principally the circumpolar deep water. When we have a positive SAM like we do today, the enhanced and strong westerlies push more circumpolar deep water to, uh, onto the continental shelf where it interacts with the grounding line and the base of the ice shelves in West Antarctica, driving glacier melt. 
and uh, there's a nice paper by Eric Rigno from 2019 that summarizes these processes. And we can see the very strongly negative mass balance in West Antarctica over the last couple of decades, which is really being driven by these changes in oceanic circulation. So understanding these westerlies may help us uh, shed insights into behaviours and patterns in Antarctica and in the Antarctic, uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula, for example. Uh, this is the uh, reconstruction of the last place of the ice sheet at the last glacier maximum by Coronato and Rabassa. This is published in 2011. And this uh, shape of the ice sheet hasn't really changed since some of the earlier work by Caldinius and Mercer in the early to mid 20th century. And we have this long, thin ice sheet that carves into the Pacific Ocean um, and terminates in these lobes on the east. So we have these. Um, uh, long thin ice sheet with an ice divide centered on the Andes. And there are hundreds of ages associated with this ice sheet uh, along yeah. the length and breadth of it um, uh, that uh, reflect the very long period of time that people have been working here. So there are radiocarbon ages, cosmogenic nucleoid ages, um, argon argon ages across the, the the length of the ice sheet. Not so much across the breadth of the ice sheet because it's very difficult to do field work uh, west of the North Patagonian ice field and South Patagonian ice field due to difficult terrain. One of the interesting features of the North Patagonian ice sheet is that uh, today we have two large lakes uh, to the east of the Northern Patagonian ice field. Uh, so we have this two very, very large lakes here, uh, hundreds of kilometers long. And these lakes drain, they both drain into Rio Baker, which drains south into the Pacific Ocean, south of the Northern Patagonian ice field. So if you put a large ice sheet along the length of the Andes, then you dam that drainage. And during the last glacier maximum, these lakes drained through the Desiado Coal and the Pinturas Coal and out through Argentina, out into the Atlantic Ocean. As the ice sheet shrank and started to fragment, new drainage pathways back into the Pacific Ocean began to evolve. And we get a series of lakes forming at different elevations as different coals become free of ice. And if you go to Lago uh, General Carrera, uh, Buenos Aires today, you will see around the rim of the lake, a series of stepped deltas and shorelines that denote the different elevations that the lake stabilized at as different drainage pathways became available. And there's been a really long history of work to try and untangle what the, those drainage pathways were. It's been especially challenging because uh, glacial isostatic depression means that um, features at one end of the lake don't necessarily match up with the coal uh, at the other end of the lake. So that's made it very difficult to work out what those drainage coals were. Uh, so uh, new work by Varel Thorndecraft in 2018 really helps to untangle those, those features. So the aims of Pat Ice were to build on that really long history of research and to attempt to integrate it into a coherent and consistent data set. I aimed to take a state-of-the-art compilation of published ages and geomorphology that are published in hundreds of different papers and to compile them, recalibrate the ages, assess the ages and bring them all together into a consistent data set. I also wanted to include the geomorphology. So include the evidence of glacier fluctuations and glacier lake fluctuations and use those to attempt to uh, create new reconstructions of the ice sheet. And this hasn't ever been attempted at this scale before. So there's, a, there's been a long-standing reconstruction of the LGM ice sheet, but the behavior of the ice sheet as it shrank during the last glaciation and into the Holocene has not been attempted on a, a coherent scale across the entire latitudinal range of the ice sheet. All ages were recalibrated or recalculated according to the latest protocols. Uh, using the most information I could find. And I also uh, was able to correct a lot of ages um, that maybe I found some slight errors in the papers and, and fix those errors and to uh, generate a really up-to-date database. My goal was not just to create an understanding of that ice sheet at the Arsgeisen maximum, but to reconstruct the ice sheet at 5,000 year time slices 
from the 35,000 years ago right through to the present day and to integrate it with the glacier lakes. So for the first time, attempt to show the glacier lake changing, the glaciers changing and the different elevations and sizes of those lakes through time. I threw in a couple of extra time sizes during the Antarctic cold traversal and during the latest Holocene neoglaciation uh, that, had, that had its maximum advance in the last few hundred years uh, because there is so much data for them, they are, are very well constrained. But um, otherwise it was at 5,000 year time slices. Unlike uh, the Laurentide ice sheet and the Eurasian ice sheet, which have been subjected to 1,000 year time slices in recent reviews like Dated One or the Dalton review of the Laurentide ice sheet, there isn't quite the uh, density of data in Patagonia to allow for an ice sheet wide 1,000 year scale reconstruction. And I think you'll see, you'll agree that uh, 5,000 years is, is, is um, the most we can do with the data available at the moment. And I was keen to highlight uh, research priorities. So to show where we have good information, where people can uh, have high confidence in those margins and really ensure their models fit those margins with independent climate forcing data but also to show where we really don't know anything and to encourage people to go to new areas where we have big gaps in our knowledge. This is the, the database. So on this map, you can see I have a geomorphological map. So we've got uh, glacier cirques in red here. We've got moraines in brown, um, and you probably can't see them at this scale, but there are also features like perch deltas and shorelines. Uh, as well as glacial lineations, um, sedimentary lineations like, um, like drumlins and, and things like that. I also mapped uh, bedrock lineations, so things like Roche Moutonne, but they're not shown on this map because otherwise the whole thing would just be green. You can also see on the map a large number of published ages. So each point is a published age. We've got a lot of red stars up here in the Chilean Lake District. These are radiocarbon ages. Uh, and then around the northern Patagonian ice field, there's an awful lot of green triangles, which are uh, cosmogenic ages. So there's been a lot of people have gone to these areas and done a lot of focused work on the moraines. And then you can see in other areas, there are large numbers of moraines with almost no ages at all. Uh, optically stimulated luminescence are yellow circles, so they're spread, spread around the place. Um, and then we have um, some diamonds, these orange diamonds are argon argon ages, these tend to be much older and not really that useful for the time scale that we're looking at. Uh, there's also a large number of volcanoes in Patagonia and there's been some good work to look at the tephrochronology. In a, to look at the most, the most recent time slices, I also included historical documents, so historical archives of uh, explorations of ship documents, uh, dendrochronology to look at tree rings, uh, and even lichenometry, which can date back to maybe up to a thousand years and in the best circumstances. Um, there's a small number of marine sediment cores. Unlike the continental shelves of the Antarctic Peninsula or South Georgia, there's a real dearth of information on the continental shelf. So just a small number of continental shelf, of, of cores, marine sediment cores on the continental shelf. And you can see all the, this, this bar chart just shows all the landforms. So we've got um, tens of thousands of moraines uh, and bedrock lineations, um, and then a small number of uh, river terraces and volcanoes and things like that at the other end of the scale. Um, all this data comes from peer reviewed literature uh, and where there were gaps in the geomorphological record, I supplemented that with novel geomorphological mapping to try and fill the gaps, make a complete record. Um, sometimes people provided shapefiles, either when I emailed them and requested them or as part of their open data. Uh, if that wasn't possible, I sometimes had to re-digitise people's published mapping and, and uh, use satellite imagery to try and work out which moraines they'd dated uh, and looked at in their paper. Uh, so sometimes there was quite a lot of detective work trying to find the in the satellite image the moraines that have been dated and or the lakes that have been cored in certain places. I also used the JEPCO database for the continental shelf, but it's really very low resolution. So unfortunately, I was able to map 
where we have bathymetric troughs, but that was about the limit to, to the scale of the mapping. I can map the continent, the edge of the continental shelf, and the, which is this uh, train track line here, and these bathymetric trough, troughs, which look like shark's teeth, but I wasn't able to map moraines and trough mouth fans, which I'm sure are there on the continental shelf. So the first thing I wanted to discuss was some of the glacial land systems in Patagonia. And I, we, we figured out that there were perhaps four key land systems. Uh, there is a mountain glacial land system that's quite endemic in Patagonia today, uh, a lowland but land terminating glacier system that would have been very common during the last glacial maximum, and a lowland glacial lacustrine land system that dominated in many fjords and many troughs uh, during glacier recession and continues to dominate in many parts of Patagonia today. And then along the Pacific margin, we have a glacier marine land system that's dominating. In upland areas, these are very temperate glaciers, they are shrinking, and the upland glacier mountain land system has many of the uh, features we would expect in an alpine setting. So we have cirques, we have glaciers and snow patches, uh, beautiful, beautiful flutes, and um, little moraines, little annual moraines sometimes, little sawtooth moraines. Um, and we also have a large number of things like moraine dammed lakes, uh, particularly in the Cirque over deepenings. In some places like the Chilean Lake District, during the last glacial maximum, these mountain glaciers expanded and they moved from the highlands into the lowland, uh, lowland areas, the lowland plains, where they spread out and formed Piedmont Lobe glaciers. During the last glacial maximum, the land terminating glacial land system dominated. And you can see in this map from Lago Buenos Aires in Argentina, we have a large number of suites of moraines. The outermost moraines in this system are early Quaternary, early Pleistocene moraines, and the LGM moraines are the, um, the main set into the inside of that. Uh, and you can see in between those moraines are sander, which is this hatch colour, and a large number of uh, outwash features, outwash rivers and things like that. So in the inset figure here, you can see outwash and meltwater channels in between those moraines. So that's suggesting that these moraines are sort of aerial and the meltwater is, is feeding around them. In parts of Patagonia, we also get features like drumlins, flutes, even megascale glacial lineations. Uh, paleo channels, there's all these paleo channels here, and abundant diamecton associated with these uh, uh, temperate ice slopes. As these glaciers started to shrink, the over deepenings were filled with water to form large lakes, and many of those lakes persist today. Uh, but as the drainage pathways were blocked, they were uh, raised up to be a higher level than they are today, tens of metres higher. So for example, you can see in this photograph, there is an alluvial fan from a river today at lake level, and it's cut through and incised through a paleo delta or paleo fan, which would have been formed when the lake was at a higher level. And these form flat topped terraces perched above the lake all the way around the lake at different elevations. So here's an example you can see in uh, satellite imagery. You can see the, these flat top features that have been dissected by uh, subaerial processes, gullying and so on uh, during deglaciation. So we have things like shorelines, perched sequences of deltas at different elevations. And in some places we have things like moraineal banks that have uh, a morphology very different to the subaerial moraines we see uh, associated with the LGM glaciation. So um, much more of an asymmetric form and uh, uh, a very gentle ice proximal slope and a very steep ice distal slope associated with lake terminating glaciers. And strongly associated with this land system, we have in Patagonia large volumes of glacial lacustre embedded sands. In many places, some of those sands are varved, so they have annual laminations. And so there's been a large amount of work in recent years to create floating chronologies of those varves 
and we can relate the thickness changes in those valves to changes in sediment input into the lake and that relate that to changes in ice dynamics. Those valve chronologies can also be time anchored by using the tephrochronological framework. So there is a growing uh, coherence in the tephrostratigraphy in Patagonia and together with this valve work that's, relate, that's uh, driven forwards even at an annual scale our understanding of how these glaciers have behaved. Here is some just satellite imagery of various shorelines and raised deltas and these shorelines around Lago General Carreras and this, these images are designed by Jacob Bendel who's done a lot of the work on valve chronology in Patagonia. Here are some examples of those valve sediments. You can see these uh, beautifully laminated sands. They have a distinct annual signature uh, and they occasionally have things like drop stones in, and they exist in front of these moraines. Uh, here you can see a shoreline. The shoreline wraps around the hillside as a, as a bench. Uh, and in some places there are uh, boulders uh, deposited on it. The Glacier Marine Land System, um, I was able to map these bathymetric troughs through the low resolution visualization available in JEBCO, but we also have a few higher resolution studies, a few things that have been published by people like Julian Dowdswell and his colleagues, uh, looking at the features in the inner fjords. And they show features similar to what we see in other parts of Patagonia, so recessional moraines, uh, small transverse ridges, uh, even streamlined, streamlined landforms, all suggestive of very temperate, very active glaciers. Um, so you can see a nice recessional moraine here in figure C, and some. they also have glacier fluvial deltas around the edges. Okay, I want to think about the chronology of these ice masses. Um, the PATICE database includes 1,669 ages from nearly 150 papers. Uh, so we have radiocarbon ages, beryllium ages, OSL, tephra, lichenometry, dendrochronology, and so on. Um, each age was recalculated and recalibrated and included in the shape file as a, as a point. And those shape files include all the attribute information that you need to track down that original paper. So they'll have the sample number, the XY coordinates, the paper reference, the site name, the material, uh, the material dated, the depositional context, and then all the information you need to recalibrate it, depending on what kind of age it is. So there's one shape file for each type of age, and they have the different information they have. Um, the ages were all subjected to a quality assurance process. Um, for all ages, to be awarded the highest quality assurance scale, I had to be able to find them in the, in the landscape. So they needed to have clear geographical coordinates and they had to have a clear context. So I had to understand what they were dating. And I only included ages that were relevant. So if you have a radio, a series of ages in a, in a, in a core for radiocarbon, for example, looking at, I don't know, vegetation change during the Holocene, I only really included those basal ages. Um, so we have to be sure about the depositional context, we have to be sure about the stratigraphy, and I have to be able to find it. That proved a real challenge for some of the older papers that were largely focused on radiocarbon, so some of those papers, um, because they were a little bit more difficult to understand, didn't, get, didn't meet those criteria. Um, and then as the dating protocols have improved over more recent decades, uh, the more recent papers would tend to receive a higher um, as GPS coordinates become more available and the, the GPS, the GIS and satellite data and the images becomes more, more straightforward, it was easier to find. But it would, I would give a plea to anyone who's publishing ages to please make sure that people can track them down because even some recent papers, it was quite difficult to work out what they've been dated. Um, so they had to be in stratigraphic order and they had to not be considered an outlier by the original authors. So if it was considered an outlier by the original authors, then I also considered it to be an outlier. Um, and it had to, uh, then they had to meet for each, each sample, they had to meet certain criteria for different dating materials. So they, they were a dating method dependent. But here you can see the different uh, age reliability ratings for these different, um, different types of aging. 
you can see that there is geographically quite a spread. There is quite a, a range of ages and different places, depending on the, um, the lead authors who tended to focus in certain areas. The uh, beryllium ages from boulders on moraines, where I had three or more boulders on a moraine, I was able to calculate a moraine mean age. I only did this for green rated boulders, so I didn't include outliers or uh, boulders that we had deemed to be uh, unreliable for one reason or another, perhaps because they were not in a good position or there was some kind of issue with them. And I was then able to create this, these mean ages for the moraines. So in pink, you can see these mean ages for these clusters of boulders. Um, and you can see the circle around those ages, which is the reliability assessment or the quality assurance assessment. And then for each mean age, I also provide a standard deviation. So SD 0.5, for example, here. So you can see clearly the spread of ages across that moraine. I don't provide a plus or minus because standard deviations are a single positive number and I think they should be presented like this. Uh, and you can also see the geomorphology. So here you can see the black moraines. Here you can see a few drumlins here in pink and you can see these black moraines around Lago Viedma. And you can see also that the ages are concentrated in certain ages. So Lago O'Higgins has a good number of ages whereas the terminal moraines around Lago Viedma or Lago Argentino are not dated and there's no ages for these, for these moraines. Where I had a landform or a, a, a moraine with an age, I would draw a little isochron across that moraine, say either 5, 10, 15, up to 35, so to try to fit that moraine into the chronology. Uh, and then I was able to interpolate between those isochrones. So in panel B here, you can see my reconstruction. And I use those isochrons to give a confidence in my ice margin. So where it's green, I have both moraines and chronology and I can be more confident in my ice margin. Where it is orange, uh, I have maybe good geomorphology and maybe some nearby moraines, but I am lacking detailed chronological uh, evidence. And where it's red, I'm lacking both geomorphology and ages and I have made what I would consider to be a hypothesis for people to go and test. So that allows me to uh, give a degree of confidence in my ice margin and I repeat that step for every time slice in the PATICE database. And in panel C, I use uh, the geomorphology and the outlines to create a schematic ice flow pathways. So you can see the direction of ice flow, so orthogonal to moraines and in line with any drumlins or other ice flow indicators. We don't tend to see complicated uh, drift in these ice flow indicators in the same way that we would see flow sets in drumlins and perhaps Laurentide ice sheet or the Eurasian ice sheet because this is much more topographically confined and these lobes are probably flown in the same direction multiple glaciations. This is the eventual LGM pat ice reconstruction. They have a series of lobes here that have their different names. And you can see the, um, the high confidence, medium confidence and low confidence. So for example, I can be fairly confident or medium confident that the ice sheet reached the continental shelf edge because any deeper in it would probably be carving and it's going to be receiving lots of precipitation from there, but I don't really have much chronology. So I can't give it a high confidence. And there are certain lobes that are extremely well dated and they can have high confidence. And then in between those lobes, we have maybe really good geomorphology, but lacking the chronology. In other places, even the geomorphology is quite hard to find and determining which is the LGM moraine, for example, is quite difficult. And so in there we have lower confidence limits. Uh, and in panel B here, you can see these, the schematic uh, ice divide here in the dashed line. And I kept that ice divide just the same in each, in each time size because I don't have the vertical gradients in chronology I would need to determine that ice divide shift. And you can see the ice flow pathways occupying the bathymetric troughs, for example, that I mapped. And you can also see a couple of pink lakes and a couple of stars that show where those lakes drained. We repeated that process through time. So we're able to have a completely coherent assessment of confidence at each time slice from 35,000 years ago to the present day. 
which includes the changing lakes. So you can see the lakes changing and evolving as different pathways um, are opening. In some places, I was able to use dated falls in lakes to assume that a coal had opened and that helps, helped me to determine the fragmentation of ice around the northern Patagonian ice field, for example. So you can see the, the large lakes uh, on the other side of the northern Patagonian ice field evolving through the Antarctic cold traversal. Okay. The last go to maximum uh, was uh, dated around 30 to 30, 33,000 years ago. It's really well dated in the northern sector of the Chilean line ice, um, no, northern uh, Chilean ice lake district sector of the ice field. It's really well dated there. Um, and further south, uh, down here, we have an earlier LGM from around 47,000 years ago, south of 48 degrees south. So we have evidence of a latitudinal gradient in this ice field. Uh, and we argue that the, uh, this early local LGM at 47,000 years ago is driven by changes in southern ocean surface temperatures and low carbon, atmospheric carbon dioxide, and it seems out of phase with the northern hemisphere. Uh, and it's likely that this large ice sheet was sustained by a northward shift in those southern westerly winds. The ice field remained uh, at that large size and it shrank slightly during the global LGM about 19 to 23,000 years ago. So the 20 Ka time size is slightly smaller, um, but not substantially. So you can see that the, uh, the ice field uh, only shrinks slightly through that time. Deglaciation really accelerated. Um, and again, we have a latitudinal gradient. Uh, so deglaciation accelerated from 17.7 thousand years ago from 38 to 47 degrees south. And 47 degrees south is approximately the northern Patagonian ice field. And south of uh, down here, uh, south of the southern Patagonian ice field, it was more like 19 thousand years ago. And, and this is during a period of really rapid warming in the Antarctic ice cores uh, around 18,000 years ago and rising sea levels. And as, those, as that ice sheet started to shrink, we initiated carving into those lakes and that really started to drive really rapid rates of ice loss. Uh, by 20,000 years ago, again, we still have a coherent ice sheet, but the ice field is starting to shrink and starting to carve into these lakes, which you can see starting to form around much of the uh, margin of the ice. Uh, there is a large amount of uncertainty about what's happening uh, in the Pacific sector, and I encourage anyone to, who can shed light on that to, to do so. During the Antarctic cold traversal, there is a really strong evidence in certain key sectors for a, a stabilization of the ice mass. Um, and there is widespread development of these paleo lakes. So you can see large paleo lakes developing along, this, uh, ice, along these disparate ice fields. There isn't so much evidence of an Antarctic cold traversal in the northern sector. It's unclear whether that's because there wasn't an Antarctic cold traversal event there or just because there hasn't been, the, the data hasn't been published. And um, I think that's a hypothesis for, that requires further work as there is evidence of ACR stabilizations further north in the Andes. Uh, during this time, the SAM is in a positive phase and the core migrates northwards and that is sustaining these uh, stabilizations of these glaciers. And then as they start to, as these ice fields start to fragment further after the Antarctic cold reversal, we get these really rapid drainage reversals and really rapid drainage of the lakes. So you can see the ice fields um, starting to rapidly shrink as the glaciers, um, as the glaciers uh, shrink. Around 10,000 years ago, there is again evidence of a stabilization of the glaciers. It tends to be well within the ACR limits. And during this time, the Pedia lakes are largely uh, within the um, size that they are today. So they've largely achieved the present day configuration. It's slightly cooler and drier in this time. Um, but then we see after this, we get really rapid recession during the early Holocene warm dry period. 
from around four to six thousand years ago and again during the late Holocene around one to two thousand years ago there's quite widespread evidence of a re-advance of the glaciers well within the 10 ka limits um, but quite well dated in a few different sites and a few different glaciers across that across that latitude again limited data in the north of the sector but more confidence in the south uh, and we think this is largely associated with um, uh, changes in the southern annular mode. So this work by Mike shows uh, the early Holocene warm dry period when we get lots of glacier recession and then these phases of um, uh, SAM changes where we have um, uh, re-advances of the glaciers synchronous with that. Um, the Holocene climatic optimum from four to 3,000 years ago had positive SAM conditions. And during that time, there's uh, evidence of a temporal gap in moraine building with very few radio um, very few cosmogenic ages of that time. This is just a histogram of, of 10 brillium ages, brillium 10 ages. And you can see from that four to three, there is a real gap in the moraine building phase. Uh, and then we get these big uh, moraines that are quite well dated with clusters of moraines around two and around one, probably associated with these uh, uh, negative SAM conditions. The latest Holocene was a re-advance around 0.2 thousand years ago, associated with a negative southern annular mode. And then we have rapid uh, recession during the 20th century, when we've had persistently positive SAM conditions. We can attempt to compare these uh, rates of recession with uh, present day. So here we have in grey the Patagonian ice sheet area and in black the absolute rate of recession in kilometres squared per annum and the relative rate of recession in percentage change, the Antarctic ice core record and global sea level. And we can see that the really high rates of change we see today rival those we saw throughout the Holocene. Um, we have fewer degrees of freedom of ice sheet change during the Holocene. We can't rule out very fast rates during deglaciation based on the timescale of our reconstruction, but we do see rates of change today that are extraordinary in the Holocene uh, or exceptional in the Holocene. Um, the long-term mean SAM index is now the highest positive value for a thousand years and it's projected to continue to produce drier conditions during the 21st century. So that suggests that the sensitivity we've seen to the SAM in Patagonia will continue and that will drive really rapid recession of these glaciers over the next few decades. And it may also be affected by El Nino during El Nino years that decreases the strength of the westerly winds and reduces rainfall and this extreme El Nino events are likely to increase and that will further exacerbate glacier recession in Patagonia. These combined effects will uh, reduce precipitation, increase droughts and further glacier recession over the 21st century. Right. I'll sum up quickly Future research priorities, we need more constraints on vertical ice uh, extent, which are very limited, and more information on the Holocene. And the synchronicity of ice dynamics is difficult to assess due to a paucity of data in lots of places, and the directions of ice flow and the location of the ice divide, and in Western Patagonia there's very little data. Um, so that's just summarising the reconstruction and summarising that, there we go. And I'll just zoom on to the data availability. Uh, all the data is available in the open access article and you can download the whole data set and shape files on mentally data. And we were pleased to make a series of public engagement resources, including web maps, so that people can explore the data set even without an ArcGIS license. So you can see the web map here, and this is available to anybody who has the link and you can I can provide the link to anybody who's interested. Okay, and I will take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Bethan. That was a really uh, neat talk. Do, do we have any questions from the audience? I'll put the data availability back. Just give you a moment. Sometimes people are clamoring to uh, unmute.
see. I have a question. Should I just should I just go? Yeah, <laughs> yeah please. Um, thanks so much for the talk. This is really great and such detailed work, which I know it takes a huge amount of work and this very much appreciate it. Um, I was wondering about the lakes that you talked about and um, whether, and I think you mentioned that some of the shorelines, yeah, you mentioned that some of the shorelines, you know, mismatch from one end of the lake to the other end of, end of the lake due to deformation. And I was wondering whether, yeah, whether those lake levels have been along with the ice sheet mapped out and whether you looked at, okay, these deformation patterns within the lake and that whether that can tell you something about solar earth deformation and the loading of the ice sheet. I, I work on GIA modeling, so that's yeah, why. Yeah, I'm sure, I I'm sure it could. I'm sure it could. And I, that, work, that work would be a really important contribution. Um, so Verrill Sundercraft in his, in his paper, which published before Pat Ice, we took the modeled shorelines that he had he had produced and used them to reconstruct the lakes at different time scales. Mm -hmm. So he was able to map uh, the shorelines at very high resolution along the ice, along the shoreline, along the lake, sorry, and look at the uh, the tilt of the shoreline across the lake by interpolating between all the different steps and provide um, chronology on that using Bayesian modeling, Bayesian oh, age you. modeling. So the empirical data is, is there and is available. And I think the next step would definitely be to take that and use it in a GIA model. Um, but I don't think that's been done to date, but I think it would be a great contribution. Cool, thank you. Uh, we have a question from, oh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. So there's a question from Vivian saying, um, please, can you explain why the ice began receding um, earlier in, this, in the south rather than the north, which would be expected to have been warmer? Okay, so we think that the ice field started to recede um, at different times and different places probably associated with a variety of different factors like the core of the southern westerly winds uh, uh, changing and also due to um, so, uh, ocean currents. So I think I discussed that up here. So you were talking about, I think the Holocene seems to be fairly synchronous throughout the ice field. We tend to get Holocene re-advances at the same time. Um, and we get the ACR, so we're talking about here. Yeah, so we have a deglaciation at different times uh, in different places, uh, probably to do with um, changes in the, the winds and also in uh, ocean temperatures, I think, which are driving the change there. So I don't think I answered that very well. <laughs> Just looking at this, I wonder if the topography also might be playing a role in that. Yeah, I'm sure. And I think also these, these moraines in the north are quite difficult to date because the moraines that have been well dated are today filled with lakes. And I think a lot of these moraines here are not well dated. And I think it would be interesting to see if there are, what ages are on these moraines because the 17.7 thousand years age from here does come from point data from lake sediment cores rather than from the south where it comes from multiple beryllium ages on moraines. So there is a, very, a difference in the chrono chronological tools used and that can mean different interpretations as well. So people need to go and date some of these red moraines up here. So there's a, another question in the chat from Allegra. Um, did excess volcanism coincide with ice sheet retreat? Oh gosh, um, there are a number of well-documented eruptions uh, in Patagonia and we've used some of the most geochemically different ones to reconstruct uh, used to reconstruct the dating of ash layers and, and to help reconstruct the, the timing of ice-free conditions in different places. Um, and the most significant ones are often in things like the early Holocene warm period, um, so not necessarily uh, clearly really associated with periods of rapid stabilization or rapid recession. So there's, I'm not sure there's a direct correlation there. I'd need to double check the timings of all the, all the volcanic eruptions, but I don't think we're seeing 
volcanic eruptions at the times when we're getting rapid recession of the glaciers. Although we do see ash falling on some of these ice, ice fields further north where we get volcanoes with glaciers on them, that does seem to affect ablation of these glaciers. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if after a vol, uh, vol, large volcanic eruption, you might see a slight cooling associated with aerosols, but that would only be for like a year or two, which you probably wouldn't see in uh, a short term. I, I, would want, I mean, it, it's more like when you have a volcanic eruption, the de deposition of ash uh, changes the surface mass balance and the yeah. darker surface tips you towards, it, it reinforces it's been observed um, in more recent periods in the 20th century in the north in the north where we get these volca volcanoes with glaciers on um we get changes in glacier mass balance associated with volcanic ash um but i don't think we can link things like the major hudson eruptions with glacier change but i think you would probably need a more detailed resolution reconstruction to answer that question exactly i think they're more driven by larger scale uh, wind patterns and atmospheric circulation patterns. Um, so there, 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 there are a couple of uh, more questions in the chat. There's one from uh, Laurie Padman. Um, the primary focus seems to be on precipitation, but is there a strong change in seasonality so that summer melt is the driver? So we look at uh, the temperature from the Antarctic ice cores somewhere down here. We've got the temperature from the Antarctic ice cores. Uh, temperature ice cores from Patagonia are challenging due to the large amount of melt in surface melt in Patagonia. So this is these are like the most most useful ice cores. And then there are paleo temperatures from things like uh, proxy evidence from lakes and things like that. Um, but they're not. I don't think they're high resolution enough to differentiate changes in seasonality. Um, but we do have independent records of lake levels uh, from these uh, lakes that are disconnected from the glaciers. Um, and we can look at precipitation change from them and we are able to relate the glacier change to the changes in the precipitation. And today, the glaciers seem to be very sensitive to the changes in precipitation. So uh, we have a couple more. Uh, thank you. We, we have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, I think it'd be nice to have some other people talk uh, other than me reading all of these out. So I'm going to pick on, is it Dieter? Is there any chance you'd like to unmute and ask your question? Hi, yes. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering if out of your reconstruction, you were able to, to estimate the highest elevation of the reconstructed ice sheet. Um, if, uh, if you have an idea of where it was the, the thickest part of the ice sheet, and, and where these sites would have been located. Thank you. This is a really great question and it's certainly something we were keen to do, but there's a real lack of elevation data in Patagonia. So we need people to take helicopters and do transects of the Patagonian ice field to do transects down and attacks to look at elevation change. Um, that's been done quite effectively in places like Antarctica, but that work hasn't been done in Patagonia to date. Um, and I think we need to do those kinds of projects in order to answer those kinds of important questions. But we don't have that information at the moment, unfortunately. Or you could use GIA modelling, perhaps, to look at where you get the biggest, biggest, uh, biggest loading. Um, but we need more, need more work on that. Uh, Ronnie, are you still with us? Is there any chance you'd like to uh, ask? Ask your question. I think Ron might have left. Oh, no, he is. Hello? I, I, I can ask. So uh, Ron, uh, Ron's asking, uh, uh, Antarctic cold reversal. Um, you said that the jet core shifter, shifted equatorward. Um, how do we infer past wind strength and core location? Um, so the past wind strength can be uh, interpreted from a number of different proxy records. So, for example, it's been interpreted from ice core records in Antarctica. So we have the SAM index from Antarctic ice cores here. 
Um, and it can also be interpreted from lake levels. So we have a lake level record here. This is from 51 degrees south. These are lakes that are uh, separate from the glaciers, so they're not being influenced by changes in meltwater, but are being influenced by changes in precipitation. Um, and Mike might be a better place to answer questions on this, as this was his paper. Um, but he was looking at changes in the lake level and dating those changes, and um, also using pollen uh, to look at changes in environmental conditions. And there are a number of paleoproxy studies in Patagonia that use proxies like pollen to look at changing vegetation and to make inferences about um, changing precipitation patterns. And then we infer that those changing precipitation patterns are associated with winds. There are a few studies from really quite far south in Patagonia where people have looked at things like diatoms in lakes and inferred things like uh, changes in wind strength from that. So the, I think this uh, SAM index can be pulled together from a large number of stores of, of, of proxy records. So uh, pollen records, lake level records, ice core records, wind, windiness records um, to tie the, tie the SAM index together. Should I should I add a comment or? Oh, please <laughs> so, do. Based on the, so that uh, actually, this pollen record's from a, another colleague, uh, Patricio Moreno, and it's based on it's based on pollen, as Bethan mentioned, and the pollen in a modern context has been tied to the modern biogeography, so they know precipitation and temperature and where it goes. So then in the past, when they look at the pollen, they link it, they basically link it. In some sites, it's more precipitation sensitive changes in pollen, like if you're right on the step. And then other places, it's more temperature sensitive. And they know this based on the modern biogeography. I, I wanted to add that the, these, the changes that this it tends with the negative SAM, it tends to be cold and wet and in positive SAM, it tends to be warm and dry. And I think, so I think there are, right now we're still trying to understand what happens when the westerlies change. But I, I, I tend to think of it as, as when the westerlies move north, it tends to become colder and wetter over most of Patagonia. When they move south, it becomes warmer and drier so that my talking to some of the modern climatologists is the two are not s distinct. You don't usually when you get one, you get the other cold and wet or warm and dry. And, and there are some of us I wanted to add that do think actually summer temperature is the primary control. Precipitation is very important, but it's at least both and summer temperature can be really critical. And in figures like this, it, it, it tends to be cold and wet or warm and dry, the two are working together. Actually, some of you in this group uh, have more expertise than, than, than me in this, but um, you know, similar to when our westerlies shift north and south, it's usually not just one or the other, but it's temperature and precip change together. And of course, glaciers don't like warm and dry conditions. Getting to Ron's question, I it 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 goes back to the well, Beth mentioned the paleoecology that the paleoecologists have been working on, where they've 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 you know they've tied their modern vegetation distributions to modern climate, and so in the past they can see these things moving around. I have another question. Um, so do atmospheric rivers, I know, are pretty important in Chile today. Uh, did they play an important role in melting processes in the past? Atmospheric rivers, did you say? So, can you say that again? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, atmospheric rivers, like, they, you know, they, they've yeah. been associated with Greenland melting events in the, in the present day. And I can, I know that in the present day, Chile gets its share of atmospheric rivers. Yeah. Patagonia too. 
I so think what we need is more detailed, uh, coupled simulations to answer these kinds of questions. I mean, the we are only now at the stage where we can start to say the ice sheet was at this stage with this degree of confidence, and that enables us to position ourselves to answer those kinds of interesting questions. Um, but uh, we need, I think, we need more more information to to answer these uh, these kinds of things at the moment. It's difficult. We have, I mean, we can relate to the changes in the ice slopes terminating in Lago General Carrera with uh, ENSO and features like this. And we know that we have uh, ENSO is driving a big uh, effect in Patagonia. We can see that today, like in 2016, uh, we have a big uh, uh, event in Patagonia. Um, but it's, I think we need more work to answer those kinds of questions. Okie doke. Um, do we have any uh, final questions um, from anyone? We, we, we're a little bit over here. Um, and uh, thank you very much Beth, for a fascinating talk, but we should we should uh, close off soon. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's, there's a comment from uh, Vincent um, in the chat. Confidence for placement of the Pacific boundary during the glacial maximum seems to be medium to low. Is there a reason the boundary is placed at the shelf break? Um, so the boundary is placed at the shelf break at the LGM because we assume that the ice field will be receiving most of its precipitation from the west and it will largely be limited by the location of deep water. So we place it there. But I, as you can see, it has an orange boundary because I can't be too confident in the face of limited data. Um, and that boundary decreases in confidence as we move through the deglaciation and start to shrink because of the lack, the paucity of data in Western Patagonia. So really that's an area for, as well as vertical gradients, that's an area for urgent research. Um, there is, it's very unclear, for example, if there's a little ice cap here, if it's separate or joined at the moment, it's like a little dog leg, but it doesn't look right to me. But there is evidence of ice free conditions in between and glacial conditions in there. So there is a lot of a lot of work that needs to be done to to untie that. But we assume it goes to the continental shelf break because when we look at the relative sea level record from this area, it's likely that that would have been above sea level and been um, been dry land. So there would have been nothing to impede the ice from reaching that continental shelf break, particularly given the predominant wind direction. You can see it, see it there. And we can trace it also, we've got a good degree of confidence in these marines that we can sort of trace it going out, out here, out, moving out west uh, and then coming in here. And there's no moraines really that we can see here, but there's a lot of temperate rainforest here that makes it difficult to see geomorphology and difficult to visit in the field as well. Okay, th th thanks, Bethan. Um, I'm going to have to uh, close out soon because uh, there are a couple of us that have to go to a, a meeting in a moment. Um, so if you're part of the GIST team, I mean, you know what that is. Um, but uh, thanks very much again uh, for a really interesting talk. Thank you. Thank um, you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do, uh, are there any final questions from anyone? Nope. Okay, no. Thank you. And I, I hope you have a, a, a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.